today Electropages is here in Austin, Texas for the very first Embedded World Show and I can tell you the stuff that we're seeing today is really, really exciting. So today we're at the Silicon Labs booth and I'm joined by Parker, or second name Parker. Thank you very much. Uh, so just before we dive into the uh, things you are showing off here, just tell the audience who you are, what you do, and what it is you like to do in your free time. Sure, uh, yeah, hi, my, my name's Parker. I'm a Bluetooth product manager at Silicon Labs. Uh, I manage software roadmaps, I monitor progress at the Bluetooth SIG, and I'm constantly working on the new features at Silicon Labs for Bluetooth. Fantastic, so, what are you showing today? What's going on here? Because we've got some really cool looking boards. Yeah, okay, so uh, this is a demo for something called channel sounding. Channel sounding is a standardized procedure for two Bluetooth low energy connected endpoints to measure the relative distance between them. So in this case, we have this board, uh, which is a, uh, a board that has a, a Silicon Labs uh, MG24 on it, and it also has two antenna, two PCB antenna, one, or not PCB, IFA antennas, one here and one here, very tiny. This board is 30 by 30 millimeters uh, in size. We purposefully designed it this small so that we could show people that channel sounding fits in a key fob form factor. There's not really much limitation on how small you can make a board that supports channel sounding. Um, and this is really important for us to convey, I think, because uh, other um, location services that have been standardized by the Bluetooth SIG sometimes come with uh, pretty intense design constraints on the antenna. And in this case, you're kind of free of those constraints. So. We have this board, we have another board right here, and both of these boards in this demo are going to connect to each other and then perform ranging against each other. We're gonna visualize the distance between the two boards using this tool. This is a tool inside Simplicity Studio, which is Silicon Labs' sort of all-in-one developer environment. This is the CS Analyzer tool, um, and what we're going to do is, the tool is going to connect to this guy. I'm going to, and then it's going to start scanning for these guys, and it's going to connect, and then we'll just start seeing data. So, okay, first step, I'm going to connect to this guy. It's going to start scanning for reflectors. It found that guy. Going to connect, and then we'll start looking at. One thing about channel sounding is that there are two modes of operation. One is called phase based ranging, the other is called round trip time or RTT. Generally, phase based ranging is the method that you use to get the most accurate data, and so we'll just use that one. We'll start seeing uh, a connection happen on screen. Just to, uh, to fix one problem that we'll see, I'm going to limit the maximum value to 10 meters. Oops. There. Okay, so first things first. The blue line is RSSI. That's received signal strength. Basically, this guy measuring this, the signal strength coming from this guy. That is the only way that we really had to do distance estimation for Bluetooth until channel sounding ratified earlier this year. Uh, so you can see Bluetooth, RSSI, not super accurate. If I move my hand next to it, it becomes kind of even worse and like more, well, like it becomes like even even less sort of uh, reliable. Whereas channel sounding, the red line remains fairly solid, fairly reliable. We use two antennas on each board here and we are measuring across each antenna path, four antenna paths total, which gives you the maximum robustness against multipath interference sources and other problems that are caused by board orientation. Uh, and so that's basically the, uh, the demo. If I back up a little bit, you can see that there's a sort of a modest increase here. The scale here is uh, 10 meters. Meanwhile, our SSI is almost useless in its output. Um, and so we believe the channel sounding, because of how robust it seems to be, against a lot of common interference sources and other challenges. We believe that there's a lot of applicability for channel sounding in automotive, uh, passive entry, passive start applications, as well as numerous non-automotive applications like smart locks, indoor navigation, uh, all kinds of geofencing and asset tracking applications. Right, so that is really cool, but I have a few questions. And the yes. first one is to talk about the antennas on the board itself. Yes. Oh, you call these IF, was it IFAs, is it? Uh, yeah, 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 they're just designed. One of them is, uh, 
you can you kind of have to hold it right in the in the screen and get a glare. Oh, but like one so of them is there and one of them is. Oh, I can see it. It's so hard to see. So it's under the solder mask, but I can see it. So you're saying that these are not the same as a PCB trace antenna? Well, are they sort of like? It's a, it's essentially a PCB trace. Antenna. And so that helps to eliminate the need for an external connector. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. But you could use that if you wanted. But yeah. But, it, but here's my other question though. So. I'm guessing this is different to things like ultra wideband and, and, and uh, in terms of distance sensing. Uh, so there's a, a few differences between channel sounding and ultra wideband. First of all, is just the frequency spectrum it uses. This is over a 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth connection, right? right? UWB operates over five and six gigahertz. So that's going to have some differences in performance in terms of range, in terms of uh, susceptibility to human body kind of obstructions, things like that. Um, channel sounding is operating over a Bluetooth low energy connection, whereas UWB is essentially just a transceiver yeah. that still requires BLE for a data channel in almost every use case, right? Yeah. And so those are kind of some differences. UWB includes direction finding as well as distance estimation. Channel sending is distance estimation only, uh, although there is a Bluetooth spec for direction finding called you know, AOA, AOD technology. Yeah. So, so what, what's the major advantage of, of, of using channel sounding compared to other to other technologies like ultra wideband? What would you say is the most sure. important the most important advantage? The, well, the key thing about channel sounding is that it's exercising a new feature on a chip that's probably already in your system. It's using a because ah. it's it's Bluetooth, right? And so, so many even you know multi protocol systems still use Bluetooth for provisioning or for diagnostics. So there's a way to add value to parts using this uh, so, with no extra bomb cost. And, right? so what you're, and so you're saying is that there, there, there are probably devices out there already that could do this without needing any hardware. Well, that's, that's a bit of a catch because channel sounding as a spec has some pretty strict timing requirements. Right. And so there aren't a lot of devices on the market today in the embedded space that can support it. That's a way that Silicon Labs is actually kind of differentiated here because our chip is already in mass production and it supports channel sounding. Uh, but you know, you'll probably, speculating here, you'll probably see pickup for channel sounding in phones and other places uh, in the coming year or so. And at that point, you have a really vibrant ecosystem of accessories that can do ranging and phones that can support it across channel sounding. And so, I take so, so you're planning to put this into more than just phones. You're talking IoT devices. You're talking small devices. Are we talking keys, wallets, that kind of thing as well? I, so we see applicability for channel sounding in lots of devices. Everything you just mentioned. It's really a matter of at a system level what the designer wants to do, what the power budget is, what the other requirements are in the system. But our goal at Silicon Labs is to try to propagate this technology across our portfolio and raise it up and try to make it as successful as possible. And so with, with, with older uh, so with older Silicon uh, Labs hardware out there at the moment, does some of that support channel sounding already? So it's something that you can upgrade in the software or is it something that you require new hardware platforms to, uh, to, to enable these uh, capabilities? So, so in most cases, chips on the market today don't support channel sounding. Right but the newer revs of channel sounding yeah. will. So this all got adopted in the Bluetooth spec, Bluetooth 6.0 in August of 20, August 27th. So it's all fairly new, right? So you'll really see the ramp for this happening in oh, 2025. This, this is actually in the official Bluetooth specification. It is, it's a, that's, that's the key thing. That makes it interoperable, right. right? That makes it interoperable and reliable because it's all wrapped around qualification that, tests and that sort of thing. And so, and so, so I suppose one of the major advantages of an engineer using that is, like you say, they've got they've got that standard to, to follow. And that's exactly and their product right. is going to be following the standard that every other company has to abide by if they want to integrate that's exactly Bluetooth right. into their system. Which gives you interoperability, which gives you ubiquity, right? That's Bluetooth's whole thing is ubiquity. Now, does that also mean then that um, if other if other companies, let's say they make a smartphone and they want to abide by the Bluetooth standards, they have to incorporate that channel sounding no, into it? No, well, the channel sounding is it's a uh, it's an optional feature in the spec, so you can technically support Bluetooth 6.0, but without supporting channel sounding, which is pretty standard for most new Bluetooth features. You know, you can you can progress along in the spec, but not support Bluetooth low energy audio or you know things of PAWR. But yeah. But then considering the major manufacturers of, let's say, smartphones, for example, say like you've got Apple and uh, you've got Android. Oh, no, Android. Android is not existing, but you know what I mean. I know yeah. what you mean. You know yeah. what I mean, the platforms. Um, Samsung. That's what I was thinking. Sure. About. Yeah. Because these are large companies, the chances are they're going to incorporate that kind of feature because they're going to want to have as many Bluetooth six features as possible in their latest devices. So it's very likely that. Uh, a lot of these sort of bigger companies will be incorporating that kind of spec into their functionality. Very likely, uh, into yes. Their yes. Yeah, so I, yeah. engineers who, who try and move over to this kind of platform now 
are, are essentially future proof, potentially future proofing their designs and, yep. their, and, and their own capabilities to what might be useful in their products in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's always the gamble that designers have to, to think about between like future proofing and exactly. kind of delivering on other priorities. But yeah, we can expect a, a really steep increase in support for channel sounding in 2025 and beyond. And you can honestly, you can see it today when Bluetooth 6.0 released. There were press releases from various silicon companies that did mention channel sending and passing. We were a little distinct because we had boards ready to go. We had our code ready to go. We had already GA'd our solution, right? Yeah. But yeah, but more is coming for sure. That makes sense. So, in, so in terms of power consumption, what are we looking at for something like this? It's an adder on top of a Bluetooth low energy connection, right? And so you're talking about whatever the RX and TX current draw is for your chip. That's what it's going to be. Yeah, and, and, but but and, and, but it also one thing about that is that you know, as with a normal Bluetooth low energy connection, there's enough configurability there for you to find the right balance between responsiveness and low power for your application, right? So you could you could configure a channel sounding, uh, you know, application to be point cell operated. Uh, it's just that you're going to have to find a balance between yeah. how often you want to update and all that stuff. Now. Now, uh, on the graph, you're, show, you're, you're saying that the, the, the blue line is, is, is representing the, uh, like the app. Uh, you may the be around here. Uh, oh, God, sorry. Do, do one more time, sorry. Um, so on the graph here, you're saying that the blue line represents like the amplitude of the signal coming in. It's like, like the raw value, essentially. Yeah. Whereas the red one is kind of, this is the Atherton process using the channel sounding. Yes. So, um, now I'm taking it. I'm taking it that the way this is working, because you mentioned you've got two antennas. Is it kind of like looking at the difference between two different signals that are coming in, and it's kind of looking at, not so much their uh, their their out, out their amplitude. They're looking at kind of like how the, maybe the phase, or is it sort yeah, of like the yeah, phase it's, carrying? It, so there's two antennas, as I mentioned, two antennas on both boards. It's four antenna paths, and so there's a channel sweep that goes across uh, 72 different channels on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum and exercises all four paths at all 72 channels. And then there's a really computationally intense algorithm that looks at the phase differences between what the initiator transmits to the reflector, what the reflector transmits back to the initiator. And after multiple milliseconds of number crunching and processing, that yields a distance estimation that you see on screen, these, these red dots. But, that, but, but, even, but like I say, even though it takes milliseconds, you don't necessarily need that kind of speed in terms of location finding. So, that, that, so essentially, in, in, in the design, that's going to be instantaneous anyway. So you'll have a much higher accuracy uh, uh, sort of reading from, from distance. That's right. So, uh, and so, in terms of like, so you, you, you're showing this, uh, we've got like coin cells here, which is quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting design choice. So that must imply that it's very, very low powered anyway. Well, yes. I mean, it, what, what we designed this board to be very much like a key fob. And part of that was we also put a, an accelerometer on the board. So there's a, an application we haven't released yet where basically channel sounding stops working until there's an event, until the, uh, until the accelerometer shows that there's movement. And at that point, uh, you know, a connection gets established. Oh, that makes sense. Again, you can so because if it's not moving, you know, it's not. It must exactly. have stayed in the same place. And that's and that's very similar to the way key fobs work today. Right now, this is just constantly working. It's not super battery friendly right now, but there's a configuration that would support you know operating over a coin tail for six months for one year. Yeah, that's brilliant. So. If an engineer wants to develop this kind of hardware, I can see some development boards. Here. Yeah. So could you uh, take us through what, what's going on here? These, this is a different demo. This is for AIML. If you want to talk, this oh, is sorry. My, yeah, yeah. No, no. The, so basically, these are the same people. Like no, it's types. not. Unfortunately, oh, okay. and I don't know anything about this. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So if an engineer does want to work on this platform, how do they go about doing that? So today we have uh, a, a, a different board that's available uh, for orders across the distributors. This board will be available by the end of the year, and so you can just order from you know every distributor you can and imagine. So currently it's not available because it's because it's, it's just not, it's, it's like it's so cutting edge. It's not even like out yet essentially. I mean, this board is. Uh, it's already being mass produced internally. We just had to stock it at the distance and stuff. But so it wouldn't be a problem if it were to go missing. Uh, no, it would be a little bit of a problem. <laughs> Those boards are still kind of scarce in Austin. Yeah. Brilliant. And so, and just out of curiosity, on here, is it is it specific? So is is the solution being uh, executed by one specific chip? Yeah. Uh, so there's a chip on here, the Silicon Labs MG24. MG24. So it's, that is, is that one there? Is it? Yeah. I think that's so. I think it's. 
that says EF N32. Oh, no, it's the other one. So the, there's that also, there? in addition to, this is a full debug uh, a, oh, an oh, evaluation oh, of course. board. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there's a, a debug circuit as well as our chip. So I think this is the MG24, right and there. this is the board controller. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and so, re, so it's, like, it's like a QFN kind of 44 size. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so are we are we going to move across here? Are we going to? Are we? I, I'll have to pull somebody else in for the rest of this. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. So I guess we'll wrap, we'll wrap the video up now. Then. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, please watch. So for any engineers who are watching this video, if they want to get involved with Silicon Lab Solutions and this brand new device, what would you recommend that they do? First step, go to scilabs.com slash channel dash sounding. That's our product page for channel sounding. You can find links there to download code, to order boards, and that sort of thing. Fantastic. So for the engineers out there, if you're interested in this solution for distance mining, channel sounding by Silicon Labs could be a solution for you. Thank you very much Thank for you. having us today. Thank you.